Hi, this is Remembering the Past with Corey Franklin, the show where we talk about people who've died recently who've had a profound effect on our history, our society, or our culture. Tonight we're going to start out with Ken Norton, who died at the age of 70. What a boxer Ken Norton was. He was part of the golden age of heavyweight boxing of the 60s and 70s, and he wasn't quite at the level of Ali, Foreman, or Frazier, but he was awfully close. He's best known for beating Ali in 1973 when Ali was just coming down off the heights. He probably gave him as bad a beating as anyone ever beat Muhammad Ali. He broke his jaw, and after that, neither was ever the fighter he was before that. They fought twice again. Ali won both, although it could be argued that Norton actually won both. And after the third fight, which a lot of people thought Norton won, his career sort of went downhill, but he was still a superb boxer. Ali always had trouble with him because of his crab stance and his great left hook. Ken Norton came out of Southern Illinois, Jacksonville. He was a superb athlete, one of the greatest athletes ever to come out of Illinois. He was a multi-sport athlete in high school. He went to college in Missouri, went into the Marines, and then he became a boxer. Here's a report on Ken Norton's career. The sport of boxing lost another iconic figure on Wednesday night as former heavyweight champion Ken Norton passed away at the age of 70. Norton was a major part of the golden era of heavyweights in the 1970s. A former Marine, Norton displayed a military work ethic inside and outside the ring. A hulking heavyweight with a chiseled physique, Norton walked opponents down behind his famous crab defense and engaged in some of the most memorable heavyweight battles of all time, in particular his legendary war with Larry Holmes in 1978. He is perhaps best known for the 39 rounds he fought with Muhammad Ali his upset win over him in 1973. Norton took advantage of Ali allowing him to apply pressure and troubled him with a well-timed up jab. His chilling power would be forever verified when he broke Ali's jaw early on in the fight. Norton would go on to become the antidote for Ali throughout his career, dropping two highly controversial decisions to him after the win, once many believed he won. Black Hercules was equally as successful in his outside ventures. He was a respected color commentator on network boxing broadcasts and appeared in more than 20 feature films, most famously starring in Mandingo. A near-fatal car crash in 1986 left him with slow, slurred speech, and Norton always remained one of the funniest and most charming and eloquent characters in all of boxing. Norton retired with a record of 42-7-1 and was inducted into the International Boxing Hall of Fame in 1992. Yeah, besides boxing, Ken Norton was famous for Mandingo. A couple words about Mandingo. It's a bad movie, but it's bad in a really sort of cheesy way. You can't turn away from it. Mandingo, the pride of his masters. Mandingo, the strongest and the bravest. This is just as much our land as it is yours. And after you hang me, kiss my ass. Let's just say Ken Norton was a better boxer than he was an actor. One other thing about Ken Norton, his son was a great football player, linebacker for the Cowboys and the 49ers. He was the first man to win three straight Super Bowls. Ken Norton Jr., and he would pay tribute to his father every time he made a great play on defense by assuming a boxing stance. That's Ken Norton, a really good boxer and a really good guy. We move on to Hiroshi Yamauchi, who died recently at the age of 85, and he is the man who built the Nintendo gaming empire. Hiroshi Yamauchi is sort of like the Steve Jobs of gaming, and there's a lot of similarities between them. Distant father who he separated from, he believed more in the art than the technology, even though he was an industrialist at heart. He was a hard guy to work for, but there was a beauty in everything he did. He's also, by the way, the owner of the Seattle Mariners, so he's responsible for the sushi at Safeco Field. I'm not really a gaming guy, so I got these two hipsters from Imagine Gaming Network to talk about Hiroshi Yamauchi. Today, one of the most influential men in video game history died. The most influential man? Perhaps. Hiroshi Yamauchi, the, the past president of Nintendo, died at 85, reigned the company for 52 years mm -hmm. before leaving in 2002. Like yeah, and in those 52 years, he turned Nintendo from a modest card-making company into a giant video game company that everybody knows on the planet. We're talking about it today because it's like, why should you remember this guy's name? I think a lot of people out there don't hear the word Yamauchi and think of this guy. Uh, Yamauchi, uh, in, in this early tenure at Nintendo, was a, a toy manufacturer and a card manufacturer. He moved into toys and from there moved into electronic games in the 1970s, just like everybody else, you know, made a kind of a Pong clone for Nintendo and stuff like that, but then went on to make Donkey Kong machines and then the NES, he yep. presided over that, the Super Game NES, Game Watch, the Game Boy, the Game Boy, 
Zelda, you know, he helped find Miyamoto and the creators of these things. He hired, you know, everybody who involved in every game you've ever played on Nintendo. He had such a careful focus on every little part of Nintendo. Like he was, he ruled it kind of with an iron fist, but he also was intimately involved in making things just awesome. Yeah, he, you know, he, he was not just a, an owner. Exactly, yeah. And he was bold and audacious and like a true legend. And this is a great quote to, to keep in mind. This is the kind of guy that will say this stuff. So right before the Wii came out around 2004, he's saying, customers are not interested in grand games with higher quality graphics and sound and epic stories. Cutting edge technologies and multiple functions do not necessarily lead to more fun. The excessively hardware oriented way of thinking is totally wrong. He just came out and said it's totally wrong. So all these next-gen systems and everything, and you can see the Nintendo today is still thinking that way. They're running the company that this guy started. Sure, well, he got behind artists instead of engineers and technicians. Yeah. Like, like Shigeru, Shigeru Miyamoto couldn't program his own game, but he was given the you know freedom to make a game about a stubborn monkey. You know, I mean, yeah. it's stuff like that that he made decisions on that were just completely different from everybody else out there. Yeah, and he's a fascinating figure. So, right, we, we just to get through the history, he was on the N64, going out right around GameCube, and then he had, I think it was a dream about the DS. Is that true? He, he came to R&D1, a division he started, uh, and said, um, how about making a system with two screens? And then they just left it with that, and uh, sure enough, the DS came out. And, he knew a lot with writing on the DS. Yeah, which is, you know, one of the best-selling game systems ever, if not the NFL series and figures. Just, that's what the legacy left behind. Early on, uh, he ran and operated a love hotel under the Nintendo name. Love hotels Nintendo are very business. common in Japan. But he owned the Mariners. He actually never saw them play a game. But He's Nintendo owns the one, Mariners, but... too. And if you go to a Mariners game in Seattle, there's a lot of Nintendo stuff there. He brought Pong to Japan, which is amazing. Yep. He licensed it from Atari and distributed it in Japan. Uh, under the Nintendo name, he has, yeah, he started a series of light gun bowling alleys, yeah. which used Zapper-like technology. Remember the NES? Everyone thinks of Duck Hunt and the Zapper. Yeah, yeah. This is before the you know there's any video games at all. Uh, just a bowling alley full of little light gun targets, and then uh, he started Nintendo's first licensing deal ever, which was in the '50s. It was a uh, Hanafuda card set that had Disney characters on it. Nintendo started with playing cards too. Yeah, sure. And uh, one other cool thing he did was oversee the release of every single NES game. Not a single NES game went past his desk without him seeing it and approving it. Yeah, he just had to be there for everything. And it created a situation for the third parties where they had to own up to anything that Yamauchi wanted. It's Incredible history. That's Hiroshi Yamauchi. If he was the Steve Jobs of gaming, then that guy that he hired who the reporters were talking about, Shigeru Miyamoto, is his Jonathan Ive. They're not only the most successful video game creators in history, they're folk heroes both in North America and in Asia. I want to talk a little bit about Gates Brown, who died recently at the age of 74, one of the great pinch hitters in baseball history. He played for the Tigers in the 60s and early 70s. He is the leading pinch hitter in American League history, more pinch hits than anybody in American League history. He couldn't play the field, but he could come off the bench in the late innings and really turn a game around. His stellar season was the Tigers' great season of 1968. During the regular season, he had an OPS of over 1,100, and he helped the Tigers get into the World Series that year. Driving out of the dugout. The citizens of Detroit arose to show the league's leading pinch hitters how much they appreciated his record-breaking contribution. Yeah, that's Ernie Harwell. In 1968 was the Tigers' magical year. We talked about it when we talked about Jim Northrup. Helped by Gates Brown's pinch hitting, the Tigers got into the World Series and beat the Cardinals in seven games, the famous seventh game where Mickey Lolich outdueled Bob Gibson. And the Cardinals' great center fielder, Kurt Flood, misjudged Northrup's line drive for the two runs that won the game. Detroit really celebrated after that one. Lolich fires. Ball is it high in the air. This should be the series. Freehand waving everybody away in foul territory. Detroit wins. Yeah, Gates Brown was a big part of that. He's an icon in Detroit. He was a good-natured, fun-loving guy. One of the famous stories about him in that 1968 season is how he got a double with a hot dog in his uniform. He had to slide into second base head first, and the hot dog got all over his uniform, and manager Mayo Smith didn't like it at all. Here's Gates telling the story 45 years later. Well, there's one I can't live down. You know, I... Uh... <clears throat> 
in this particular game, me and Norm Case, Case wasn't playing this this day, and uh, me and him were sitting on the end of the bench, sent the bad boy up to get us a couple of hot dogs and watching the game. Now, I know they never, Mayo never called on me till the 7th, 8th, or 9th. Really? 68. He came uh, 1968. It was a good year. <laughs> but anyway, all of a sudden, he stopped the game. He said, Gates, get your bat and go hit, hit for order or whoever. And he kept kind of steering my way, so I turned my back on him. I had two hot dogs, and I stuck them in my shirt. Put my shirt up. Got a couple of bats and loosened up. Out of all the time, I didn't care if I'd strike out or pop up or something. I hit one up the slot right center, and I had to go in the second head first. And you can, you can imagine that white uniform. I had ketchup and mustard and all over me, you know. And the bench, they, they, they roared with laughter, you know. They thought it was funny, but Mio didn't. As a matter of fact, they fined me $100, you know. I said, Mio, I just drove in the run, you know. He said, well, Gates, the only reason I'm not charging you more is you're not making nothing now. So, <laughs> to add insult to injury, you know. But uh, that was a kind of, you know, that was, that was a good year, can't live that one down. Gates Brown, we're going to miss him. We're going to close tonight with Jackie Lomax, who died at the age of 69. And Jackie Lomax was a British rocker who was at the Cavern Club in the early 60s. He caught the eye of Brian Epstein. And after Brian Epstein died, he caught the eye of George Harrison in 1968. At this point, George Harrison was emerging on his own as an artist and songwriter. He was chafing a little bit under the Lennon and McCartney yoke. He came back from India with his consciousness raised. And he decided to do more writing and some producing. And the first artist he produced was Jackie Lomax. Harrison got Jackie Lomax on Apple Records, and he decided to use a song that he had written about his experience in India as Jackie Lomax's first hit. It's called Sour Milk Sea. It's about what Harrison learned in India, about taking responsibility for your own life, about when you're in a bad situation, you have to get out of it. The Sour Milk Sea is the bad situation. The Beatles did a demo of it. Here is their demo of Sour Milk Sea at Abbey Road Studios in 1968. I have to believe that when George Harrison wrote that, he was thinking about his experience at Haight-Ashbury when he went there during the summer of love in August of 67, and he was just turned off by all the drugs and the dereliction he saw there. I'm going to say Sour Milk Sea was George Harrison's commentary on the counterculture. Anyway, it became the first song that he gave away to another artist. He gave it to Jackie Lomax. And he wanted to try and make sure it was a hit, so he had Paul and Ringo play on it. John and Yoko weren't around. That's about the time they supposedly started messing around with heroin. And he brought in one of his guitarist buddies, a fellow named Eric Clapton, and also one of the great studio pianists, Nicky Hopkins. Here's Jackie Lomax describing it. John and Paul just told me to go to Apple Publishing. I went there, and I got signed as a writer. I was just putting songs down on a, on a little two-track tape recorder, you know. But he'd come in and said, oh, I really like this stuff. Uh, when I get back from India, let's make an album. Despite the fact that Jackie Lomax had a great voice, he had three out of four Beatles playing on it, and Clapton did a wonderful job with the guitar licks in there. Sour Milk Sea by Jackie Lomax was never a big hit. Didn't do well at all in England. It only reached the middle of the charts here in the States, but it's become sort of a cult classic. Most people think it didn't go higher on the charts because at the same time, Apple released Hey Jude by the Beatles, and those were the days by Mary Hopkin, and those sort of overshadowed Sour Milk Sea. I'm going to close on that note. I want to thank my producer, Sid Tepps. But as a final tribute to the one-hit wonder, Jackie Lomax, we're going to play a little bit of his version of Sour Milk Sea, written and produced by George Harrison. Despite its relative lack of success, it's quite a good record. If your life's not right, doesn't satisfy you. 